everybody. We're here with Dr. Gerard McClendon today. He's a talk show host and commentator, an author, uh, a professor at the Chicago uh, at Chicago State University, and he's a producer of a film called Forgiving Cain. And I just found out he's a publisher as well. So we're going to dive in and and see what you know, see what he's been up to, and uh, have him tell us tell us what's new. So. Gerard, how's been your day? My day is going extremely well, Karen. I'm excited. I got a full night's sleep, about eight, <laughs> eight and a half hours. I worked out this morning for about an hour, hour and 10 minutes. I'm feeling fantastic, Karen. Was there anything in particular you were working on today? Well, what we're doing is we're finishing up editing of the film Forgiving Cain. We're looking at an October release. Um, virtual as well as PBS and possibly Netflix. And so we're working on the, uh, we're in post-production right now. So we're trying to do the finishing touches on the film. And uh, that's taken up most of my time. I'm also teaching summer school. So my days are pretty full, you know, lots of meetings, lots of editing, lots of teaching online, mm -hmm. you know, uh, lots of virtual asynchronous and synchronous teaching and so uh my life is full right now it's uh my calendar my every hour of the day every 15 minutes of the day is uh is jammed up you know but hey i'm always willing to make time for my good friend karen thank you i really appreciate that i know a little bit about forgiving kane and i know the story starts when you were at cltv yeah, yeah, the CLTV a few years back and uh, tragedy struck, you know, uh, I was about to go on set for my show and uh, got a phone call from my wife and, you know, she knows I'm a workaholic and, uh, you know, she's like, you need to come home immediately. I'm like, no, I'm staying here. I've got a show that's going to start in 45 minutes or so. And, uh, you know, she's like, well, give the phone to your producer. And so I'll uh, give the phone to my producer. And uh, he talks to her, hangs up the phone. He takes me to the WGN parking lot. And that's when he told me that uh, my, my parents were the, were, were the elderly couple that was found uh, dead in the forest preserves, you know. And so uh, that's, that's, you know, right when you think that you will not be a victim or uh, a casualty of violence in the Chicagoland area, it can come right to your doorstep, literally. And so, uh, you know, this has uh, been my mission and uh, uh, crusade for the last uh, 10 years to try to eradicate some of this violence and uh, to try to get people to forgive the perpetrator, uh, but at the same time, make stiffer penalties for violent criminals and uh, to uh, try to get people to forgive uh, the perpetrator. And that's what Forgiving Cain is all about. It's a documentary. And I understand you um, put the camera on and interview uh, people whose uh, families have been touched by violence. Yes, we did. We interviewed 22 families who lost a loved one to gun violence. Uh, we narrow it down to three or four families in the documentary, but we mentioned them all. And it's just, it's just too prevalent of a pattern in this city. I mean, you've got 700 murders per year and nothing is being done. You know, yeah. uh, we, uh, we're going to increase the police presence. Doesn't work. We're going to see if we can eradicate guns and have gun buybacks. Doesn't work. We're going to try to control the block so that narcotic sales don't uh, aren't prevalent, doesn't work. Nothing has worked. Uh, mayors, several mayors have tried to come up with a solution. Several governors have tried to come up with a solution. None of this stuff works. And uh, I think I've got, you know, a five or six point plan that can work, but it probably won't be implemented because there's not enough political courage. Right. So you, in, in this story, you were able to forgive early, but there's some people in your family, it took them a little longer to wrap their heads around that concept. 
yeah, forgiveness is a spiritual matter. Uh, it doesn't have a time limit on it. Some people can forgive instantly. For others, it may take an entire lifetime. You know, uh, for some of the families that we interviewed, some of them forgave early. Some of them still haven't forgiven. And that's okay. You know, uh, there isn't judgment on when you forgive or if you even choose to forgive. It's just a matter of cleansing the heart. And for me, the cleansing of the heart had to come through forgiving. Well, congratulations on just about finishing the film, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, yeah, we're excited. We're excited. Yeah, make sure I get all the details so I can talk it up on the Media Curious channel and. Uh, in my social media. I appreciate that, I sure will, I sure, sure will. Cool. Hey, tell us about the McClendon Report. So the McClendon Report is like this conglomerate. It's, it's uh, myself, uh, my brother, and a few other people who we affiliate ourselves with. And it's basically hard opinion, but opinion based on serious concrete fact. And we do this through uh, the website that we have, mcclendonreport.com, through the books that we publish. Uh, we've got podcast links on the website as well at McClendon Report. And we're just trying to get people to be thinkers, mm -hmm. you know, not to just fire up an opinion that has no basis in fact. You know, uh, the, we know that opinions aren't solely based on fact. An opinion has an, obje an objective and a subjective point to it. But the beauty of the McClendon Report is that we say some things that the average people or uh, the average television, radio, or podcast show may not say. You know, uh, that's the beauty of the McClendon Report. While everyone's focusing on rioting and looting and are they gonna tear up my neighborhood and are they gonna loot my store, the McClendon Report says, you know what? That's not even important. What's more important is human life. That's what's more important. And so if I hear one more person talk about a store being torn up that they have insurance on and they're going to get reimbursed anyway, I don't want to hear it because George Floyd took a knee on the neck. And if you try to shift the false argument by comparing buildings being torn down and human beings being killed by the police, there is no comparison whatsoever. That's strictly contrast. I, I think there's room for uh, plenty of commentary that digs a little deeper and shows a little different perspective. Um, you also um, are, are publishing Donda's Rules. Yeah, Donda's Rules, the scholarly works of Dr. Donda, West, the mother of Kanye West. She was a brilliant scholar. God bless her soul. I wish she was still here. I had the opportunity to meet her on two occasions. And uh, I asked her once, I said, you know, you really need to have your books, your scholarly works published. And she said, uh, back in the early 2000s, she says, well, Gerard, why don't you publish them? You know, and I'm like, wow, this is interesting. And I never <laughs> thought, I never thought twice about it. You open your mm -hmm. mouth and all of a sudden you do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. So I, I never thought twice about it, you know, publishing Kanye West's mother scholarly works. But, uh, but after her untimely death, you know, uh, it really made me reflect. And I realized that none of her work was printed in book form. And so what we did is we took all of her scholarly works on her uh, Chinese uh, research. She was a Fulbright scholar and went to Fujian, China. She took Kanye with her. Chi Kanye was a very young child at the time. Very few people know that Kanye West knows uh, some Mandarin and Cantonese. He's wow. definitely a world citizen. Um, Donda West was a scholar of uh, Alexander Pushkin and Russian African literature. Uh, she was a poet. Uh, of course, Kanye gets some of his chops from her being a poet. She was definitely a person who was monumental in the Black literary um, uh, platform of Chicagoland and the United States. And, and so that's why we, we published the book, uh, Donda's Rules, the scholarly works of Dr. Donda West. And uh, we also have her 
um, platform on Ebonics in the book. Mm. And uh, we also have printed her entire dissertation. She earned her doctorate from Auburn University. Mm -hmm. And we have the entire dissertation on systems theory and written composition in this book. So it's a, it's a wonderful text and it, it keeps us, uh, it, it, it lets us know that Donda West still lives in her writing and definitely through her son and through her grandchildren. That's fantastic. Um, what possessed you to get into TV and media work? I mean, you have a PhD in education, uh, education leadership, I understand, and there's mm -hmm. lots of different, you're a professor. You know, you could just keep writing things for journals and teaching your kids, um, your students. Uh, what draws you to be a publisher and an author and to, uh, a movie, a filmmaker? I realized at a very early age, Karen, that I had this gift, this ability to explain very complicated things in a very simple way. I must have been in third grade, maybe seven or eight years old when I realized this. So I knew early on that I'd probably end up being a teacher in some capacity. I taught high school English for 15 years, and then I've been a professor for 15 years. And so I knew that the academic side was always calling me. It's a calling for me. However, I also noticed that when you're an academic, the mainstream doesn't consume your work. And here's the thing about being an academic. Academics know and write about things that are critical to civilization, but if the mainstream isn't consuming it, how can it influence civilization? Right. You do that through media. Mm -hmm. You do that through radio, TV, internet. You do it through podcasting. You do it through printing books. You do it through offering content to the cultural world. Once you do that, then whatever you think, you say, you believe, that content can, can grow on Instagram then. So someone who will never pick this book up can go to Instagram on a daily basis and I'll read you one of Donda's rules. So there may be some people who aren't readers, but they're still getting Donda's rules on Facebook on Instagram, they're gonna get it on in LinkedIn, they're gonna get it in YouTube, they're gonna get it on Tumblr, they're gonna get it on Twitch, they're gonna get it on Twitter, they're gonna get it everywhere. And that's the power of media. Media can get to an individual at hyper speed. And that's what we have to focus on more and more. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you you're doing it because you're uh, a man who's with a voice who um, is uncommon in the Chicago land area. And thanks for your contributions there. As a commentator, um, and I I heard some of this in your last reply. As a commentator, what do you think your responsibility is to the greater public as you uh, are in media? And what is it that you feel responsible for? And what do you hope that they get out of your work, the public? My job and my gift and what I offer is facts and contemplation for the people. That's where, that, that's my sweet spot. Um, you know, uh, very few people, Karen, live what uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle called what? A contemplative life, a life of leisure. Leisure doesn't mean kicking back, having a drink and enjoying the sun on your balcony. Leisure means contemplation. Have you contemplated on why bad things are happening or why good things are happening or why do you even think there is a good and bad are you contemplating on why crime is high what's your contemplation on whether you personally should uh, uh, continue going to school or if you should change your job or if you should uh, influence or look at altering your family structure. This is all contemplation. And contemplation involves 
a mental capacity that says, wait a minute, let me sit back and reflect. Very few people do this. They wake up, they go to work, they eat three meals a day, they watch three hours of TV at night, they go to sleep, whoop, they wake up in the morning, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat without any contemplation. My job is to get people to contemplate again to think again to pause to you at, offer them a chance to, to pause and think yes yes and everything isn't black white everything isn't you know no yes or go stop there's this middle ground uh uh, as my brother always mentions, we look at things uh, from the left and from the right. Sometimes we have to look at things in a spherical matter. You know, uh, maybe it's not here or here. Maybe it's not even in the middle. Maybe it's here or right. maybe it's here. Maybe we have to spin the topic around and contemplate on what we haven't seen yet. And I think that's, that's where human beings need to go. You know, it's not just CNN, Fox, MSNBC, HLN. No, no, it's far beyond that. You know, um, do you read two or three newspapers a day? Do you read uh, contemplative magazines that give you different points of view? Are you a reader? You know, very few Americans are readers, Karen. Right. They we mm -hmm. we watch we watch something that someone has given us and then we regurgitate it. I'm going to yeah. tell somebody I'm going to retweet it and you didn't even check to see if it if it was true. Yeah. That's that's the sad part of society. I don't necessarily want to tell people what to do. I just want people to be critical thinkers. I hear you. And uh, I'm one of those people that uh, I do read, I, I'm, because I have friends looking over my shoulder, I do read uh, what I tweet or retweet. And then I still get hammered with, you missed the date. It was two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens. Like, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah it happens. It happens. It, um, happens to, it, it happens to all of us. I mean, you know, because we can't read everything. Uh, uh, if something, you know, titillates us, generally we like to share it with others, but sometimes we just have to sit back and just reflect, reflect on things, you know. Uh, if something's exciting to Gerard or Karen, it doesn't mean that we have to immediately retweet it. Right. You know, may maybe it's just for Karen to contemplate, all right? And then two or three days from now, she can share it with someone else. Something you were talking about is something I call navigating the gray. That not everything is one or the other. It's not left or right or black and white. It's yeah. it's gray. And there's a lot of beauty in the gray. And if you decide to uh, polarize yourself, you could be missing a whole lot of the beauty and a whole lot of minutia that really is the deepest, deeper part of a topic, of any topic or, or issue. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think... Um, yeah these are polarizing times. Yeah, very polarizing. And what happens is the powerful are the ones that end up telling the stories. So if, imagine if poor people and disenfranchised people ran television stations. Think about that. Think about if poor people did all the podcasts and all the radio and all the news. If poor and disenfranchised people, people who had a minority opinion were the ones who had the power. Wow. It's, it doesn't mean that the world would be better. We would just see a different point of view. Uh, so if, if we look at someone who is deemed a looter, all right, someone who goes into a store after it's been damaged, after a protest, and you take things, all right, now, Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But let's look at it this way. All right, people are upset. They, they take things out of a store. You grab a person who took something out of a store. You say, sir, why are you taking like all of this milk and you know these rice cakes and this cheese and this bread? Why are you taking? He says, I've got a baby to feed. Now, is it wrong? Maybe, because he's stealing the items. But check this out. That person looting 
that may have taken $50 worth of merchandise will probably do more time in jail than who? All of the Wall Street people in 2008, from 2003 to 2008, who were a part of the real estate crisis that the real estate foreclosure crisis that occurred in the United States and nobody went to prison. Yeah. That's, that's problematic. So and why didn't they go to prison? They didn't go to prison because they're powerful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Obama should have threw them all in jail. That's a, a, a <laughs> judi- ju- you know, criminal justice and the judicial system is a topic of mine that I like to pay attention to. And um, I like some things where it's going, but uh, it still needs to go faster, um, I think, in my humble Big opinion. Time. Um, absolutely absolutely i mean you can embezzle you know a hundred thousand dollars from a bank and not see one day in prison but you can take somebody's laptop and get five years in prison yeah see 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 this (laughs) see this is this is horrible this is is a problem yeah yes yes and it needs to be exposed and it's too bad that there isn't more money for journalists who are on the ground because journalists are working hard right now. They're working overtime. Oh, yeah. they're, they're working They're working 10, 12, 14 hours a day. And when they go home, a journalist is still working because they're thinking about their story. They're looking for another lead. They may get, they may get a phone call in the middle of the night for someone that may have a tip that's going to help them complete their story and solve a crime. And so, it, but because we don't have adequate funding for journalists and because a lot of journalistic platforms are being wiped out and eliminated you got newsrooms that are cutting producers and writers what a shame karen yeah what a shame yeah what a shame yeah part of why i'm doing this series is i'm hoping that the public will start understanding who the people are that are on our tvs in our newspapers on the internet and to get to know them better and understand how um, the, almost everybody I know that I'll be talking to is so uh, vigilant about um, their duty. And um, to them, it's not just a profession, it's a vocation. And they take, it's a vocation. They take their service to the public seriously. Um, not yeah. just because they're going to get in trouble with their editors if they have uh, a fact out of line, but because it matters to the, the greater public. And uh, right. we need to be informed truthfully with facts and truth. And uh, every, I, I've not found anybody that is in the profession of uh, journalism and media that isn't sincere about that. Right, absolutely. You know, even when you look at crime in Chicago, the story is always 55 shot. 11 dead, 99 shot, 27 dead. Like, you don't get to know these people's names. You don't know, and and it's because journal, there aren't enough journalists and the journalists that are out there aren't getting paid enough. There needs to be a human interest story on every person who's murdered in the city of Chicago. However, it's not gonna happen because everyone's just focusing on the body count. No right. one's focusing on the human being, the civilization within Chicago. You know, here's another thing that gets me. While we're talking about rundown communities, why are people on the West Side shooting each other? Well, journalists need more money and more time and more um, people on the ground so they can, they can research these subjects. Look, yeah. There's a reason why people from the suburbs, people from the suburbs know that they can get the best drugs from Chicago, Illinois. And so if you're, if you're coming up 290 or if you're coming up I-57 or the Dan Ryan, these shootings take place where? On 290 and I-57. Yeah. They take and they take place there for a reason. See, people, oh, hey, hey, black people just shooting each other. No, this stuff is run by cartels, and but nobody talks about that. There are people in high places, business people, 
Karen, in high places who are getting paid based on the drug trade. Nobody wants to talk about that. We just talk about, I put more police bodies on the street and everything's gonna be fine. Nope, it's not gonna be fine because you're only trying, you're only treating symptoms. Yeah. You just can't give me a pain reliever or you just can't give me a cough suppressant. Uh-uh. You got to give me a little bit more than that if you want to get guns off the street and you want to get narcotics off the street. It's going to take a lot more than that. These are tough times. We're in the middle of a pandemic <laughs> and uh, we're, um, a lot of us are looking at uh, racism uh, that is spurred by um, the killing of George Floyd yeah. and, and others. And where do you see journal? Do you think journalism's going to um, come out of this and rise again? Because we have been, there's been numerous layoffs. There's been hedge funds looking to just, you know, milk uh, media properties for what they're worth mm -hmm. and just, you know, barely put out the news. So do you think it's going to turn around? Do you, you know, do you have a crystal ball? You, you know, I think it's getting forced. I think it's getting turned around by organizations that are getting massive contributions now, Karen, because of people in high places not doing one, their due diligence and two, not being totally fair. Uh, I won't mention the company, but, but we're seeing it with the large social media company that didn't want to take white supremacist content off of its site. So over 100 very powerful companies decided we're not going to advertise on your platform anywhere. Now, because they chose not to advertise on the platform, now that particular social media platform feels that they need to remove two hundred white supremacist websites. They should have did it years ago, Karen. Yeah. But they're right. only doing it because their bottom line is being heard. Being heard. You know, and so yeah. so this is the beauty of organizations. Uh, uh, the Anti-Defamation League mentioned last week that this is the highest number of contributions that they've received like in the last 12 months because people are abusing and misusing people. The mm -hmm. NAACP is getting contributions. National Action Network is getting more contributions now because people are starting to realize that racism is a real thing. <laughs> it, it's not some figment of everyone's imagination. The country was born on racism. We're all here because of racism. Yeah. When you look, when you look, you know, when you look at Citizens Bank and Central Bank and Chase Bank, those three banks founded the slave trade. Yeah. So if you're not teaching that in public schools, nobody's going to know any better. Yeah. See, this is why the journalist is so important, Karen. The journalist. The journalist. To, to help answer the questions why Absolutely. and how and how can, what can we do about it? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at Breonna Taylor, all right? right. She's in the comfort of her own home. Right. See, see, so we get the human interest story there. She's in the comfort of her own home. They raided the wrong house and they put eight bullets in her. Yeah. Really? Right. You know, right. Uh, both, both of John, he's in the comfort of his own house and a police officer mistakenly goes in and kills him. He's yeah. eating ice cream on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, this this is so. The more we expose this, the better society can get. Because here, here's the other thing: expose Everyone's, it, expose it, and keep the conversation going. Yes, keep the conversation going. You know, you put intense heat and pressure into the situation. Because here's the other thing: you're not going to cure racism. It's not going to happen. Just like you're not going to cure sexism. It's not right. going to happen. Mm -hmm. Classism, no, not going to happen. Now, you can alter people's and influence people's behavior, but you can't legislate morality. So what has to happen is people have to start seeing how their bad behavior is going to be counterproductive to their civilization. Right, right. Thank you for that. Hey, um, as you do the work you do and trying to... Um, get people to pause and contemplate and um, 
dive into, as I said, navigate the gray, dive into the issues. Is there ever been a moment where you said to yourself or you just saw it all working and you said, this is why I do this work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think my students at Chicago State remind me of that every day that I teach in class and every day that I have office hours, uh, that we can heal the world. We can make it a better place, all right, to quote uh, one of the greatest artists to ever walk the earth. We can do that, but we first have to believe it. And here's the other thing here. We have to have a philosophy that is wrapped around what is at the highest good. Like if you wake up in the morning and you automatically have negative thoughts, you can't be at your highest good. Right. You know, a, a ladder is made so you can climb up to a higher level, right? Um, a, a cell phone is to make phone calls, text, and use social media, all right? Um, you know, a ring lamp is to light yourself when you're trying to be, when you're doing an internet show. So those three things have a highest good. They can be used for other things, but they have a highest good. The problem is mankind care, men and women haven't figured out, human beings, we haven't figured out what our purpose is. And beware the person who doesn't know their purpose. Yeah. They'll probably be violent yeah yeah <laughs> that makes sense is yeah. there when, um, you don't, when, when you don't know your purpose you operate outside of what the creator gave you to do mm -hmm. so if you're operating outside of your purpose you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing right. and you don't benefit yourself you don't benefit your family you don't benefit the earth you just sure. don't because you have no definition of self that makes sense to me. Hey, is there any projects that you got on your list that before you retire and drink your margaritas on a beach that you want to wow. get done? You got a bucket list of projects? The, the, the goal, Karen, is to write two books a year for the next 10 years. Ah, That's the goal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get, get 20 books in the can and, uh, you know, live, live off the royalties of those books. And, you know, I'll be lecturing and McClendon reporting for as long as the good creator would allow life to be in this body, you know, to get works into libraries, to continue to create textbooks, to get people to contemplate and reflect on themselves and to, uh, and to just try to make this world a better place. That's that's why I'm here, Karen Crane. I knew that. <laughs> you and I and from what I can tell, you have made your corner of the world a little better place. And that's what we could that's what, what we should all aspire to. So thank you for your work. Um, yes, thank is you. there anything more we should talk about? Anything I haven't asked? Anything that's burning, burning issue in your mind? Well, you know, I am very upset or you know yeah, yeah i'm upset and i'm concerned about everyone wanting to restart you know and go back to normalcy you right. know uh let's let's go into the next phase and once again people are valuing money more than human life you know and don't get me wrong i'm not being insensitive to people's businesses yes people need to get back to work but if you're not healthy and you're risking getting sick from COVID-19 you're not going to be here anyway and so how can you be a benefit then we really got to get this thing in check because the numbers are going up more and more each day we're probably looking as Dr. Fauci mentioned you know, we're probably looking in the next month or two at anywhere from 10, 20, 30,000 to 100,000 cases per day yeah. is what Fauci is looking at. And uh, if we take that into the fall, we're going to be in trouble. I'm just asking people to do diligence. 
you know, we have to do day, wear the mask, right? You know, it's not that hard to do. I have to wear a jacket. I have to wear pants when I leave the house. I have to wear glasses to see. I have to put the keys in my car to drive. I got to put gas in the tank. These are things I have to do to get about my day. The least I can do, the simplest thing to do, Karen, is to wear a mask. Why would anyone not want to wear a mask? It's a very easy thing to do. You don't want to wear a mask? Fine. Get a colorful mask. You know, get a personalized mask. There's some fun get ones out there now. I, I know. Get a mask to match every outfit. I mean, I've got McClendon Report masks that I wear. I've got a polka dot mask that I wear because they're fun to wear. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's, it, it, you know, we have to humor ourselves through this horrible pandemic and say, hey, there's a better way and there's a better day. We cannot look at 1919 again. <laughs> yeah no thank you <laughs> yeah dr gerard mcclendon for your time and your insight and uh Always. i'll be where i wear my mask and i've been doing my social distancing and yes. uh may you stay healthy may you stay safe may you be at peace thank you so much i appreciate you karen god bless you uh be encouraged uh keep your head up and uh stay uh i need you to stay optimistic at all times karen oh I, i'm it, it's it's not easy but i'm i'm managing it somehow so <laughs> yes 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 god bless you now okay thank you we're out